Okay. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, this is the Marine Institute Graduate Society seminar series that we typically do every second Thursday throughout the semesters. This is actually our last one for this semester, and we'll start again in January. Um, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, where you can find almost all of our seminar seminars over the past few years. So before we start, we want to provide a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the land which we, in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and Mi'kmaq. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nanatsiavit and Nanatukavit and the Inuit of Nitasanan and their ancestors as the original peoples of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with these peoples of the province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation to honor this beautiful land together. So today we will hear from Dr. Jonathan Fisher, our very own here in this building. Uh, John is an associate professor and research chair in marine fisheries ecosystem dynamics within the Center for Fisheries Ecosystems Research at the Fisheries and Marine Institute of Memorial University of Newfoundland. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, his primary research goals are to understand how changing environmental conditions, species interactions, and fisheries alter the characteristics and recovering dynamics of marine populations, communities, and ecosystems, with a focus on the Newfoundland and Labrador and the Canadian Arctic regions. Since 2021, he has also served as the chief scientist for the Marine Institute's five-year program, the Monitoring and Assessment of Marine Conservation Areas in Newfoundland and Labrador. John's research goals are achieved through collaborative research and indus with industry, academic, and government partners, and most closely with keen graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. Before joining the CFER as a research scientist in 2011, John was a postdoctoral uh, fellow concurrently with Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, and the Bedford Institute of Oceanography at Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. John received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and Master's of Science from Dalhousie University and a Bachelor of Science from Queen's University. So with that, I'll now pass it off to John. I'll just uh, share your presentation here. There we are. Super. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and to Gord as well for organizing this semester, this term. It's been great to uh, take in as many as I could, and it's great to be here to be presenting today some of the research that goes back to uh, uh, days like this picture from 2013. And sometimes when you're looking back at pictures, you sort of think uh, it's amazing how far things go, how people go in different directions. Uh, on the left there, Dr. Martin Castonguay, retired now from uh, uh, DFO at uh, Dr. Uh, Hannah Murphy, uh, now with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, Dr. Dominique Robert was with CIFR now with uh, the Institute of, uh, or is mayor at uh, Ramuski. Uh, Jason Spingle was the uh, uh, West Coast representative with uh, Fisheries Union, the FFAW, and still with that group. And uh, just interesting to think of how far things have come. And I hope to, uh, to present that within the context of the secret life. And of course, let's see if I can advance that. Sorry, I'll just get onto the slides. So the secret life uh, is not something that I've dreamed up, uh, rather I've taken it from this book from 2004. Uh, this is a great book, uh, The Secret Life of Lobsters, because it talks about lobsters, talks about uh, different challenges, and it also talks about interactions between fish harvesters and scientists and how things uh, were done in the Gulf of Maine to make great advances. Uh, and, the, uh, and on the jacket there, it even says how fish, fishermen and scientists are unraveling the mysteries of our, of our favorite crustacean. And early on in the book, there is a quote uh, from a fish harvester talking to uh, a, a fishery scientist saying, I sure as hell would like to know what's going on down there. Uh, Bruce sh said, shaking his head, when you figure it all out, he added, only half joking, let me know. And so this also might get at the sort of, uh, sort of differences of, uh, of, sort of, uh, um, sort of perspectives between fish harvesters and some scientists. And I think that part of this program uh, has sort of uh, gone in good directions in these, uh, these types of themes. So like lobsters, Atlantic halibut uh, have been fished for centuries in Canada and now support extremely lucrative fisheries. Uh, despite these features, both of these uh, critters have a number of outstanding questions that are only partly resolved uh, related to production, movements, uh, stock assessments, et cetera. 
And so in this talk, similar perhaps to Corson's book, I'm gonna highlight some collaborative work that's been done over the past 10 years between scientists, fish harvesters, and to figure out some of the secrets of uh, halibut. So if this book was written 20 years later, 2024, I think there'd be a bit of a basis for, for understanding the secret life of halibut. And as the last way to stretch this analogy, uh, perhaps too far, is just to show that uh, lobster and halibut uh, data going back to 2015 are at similar sort of price points at that time. And Atlantic halibut and Greenland halibut, it turns out, between 1990 and 2015, I haven't updated this, but those are two species of flatfish. Those are two species whose prices are well above the other ground fish uh, at, a, at a regional level, and they both increased uh, quite, uh, quite strongly. So Canadian halibut fisheries uh, are currently managed as two large units shown in pink and in green. Uh, these have been managed this way since 1987 with the Gulf of St. Lawrence population, uh, NAFO divisions for RST, and the Scotian Shelf and Southern Grand Banks uh, division being a whole lot of uh, different NAFO divisions. The Southern stock um, has been MSC certified since 2013, and the Gulf stock contributes about 39% uh, or or it's about 39% of the overall fishery within this region. And if we look at the overall sort of perspective within the context of halibut in Canada, uh, this is the picture. So uh, the black line represents Atlantic halibut, landed values from uh, DFO sources, uh, now representing $81.7 million in 2021, uh, for which the, late, uh, the data are sort of the latest. Halibut represents 35% of total Atlantic ground fish value, but represents only 8% of the volume. So again, this is a very, very high value per unit fishery. And it's actually the most valuable Atlantic ground fish uh, in Eastern Canada, uh, compared to turbot, compared to flatfishes in combination and compared to Atlantic cod. And again, this is a very uh, uh, different sort of turn of events um, in exceeding Pacific halibut. This is something that happened uh, in recent years because of this exponential increase. And now the difference between Atlantic and Pacific halibut is $38 million. And this is uh, great for Newfoundland region, the wider Atlantic region, because it supports hundreds and hundreds of uh, small vessel and larger vessel fisheries across these regions. And this work really started in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, this started in as a result of uh, presenting some work on what CIFR was up to in 2012, talking to the fisheries union, uh, talking about some of the West Coast uh, interest in halibut and the questions that were outstanding. And some of the uh, landings, um, data shown here with the TAC or the total allowable catch in red and the landings in these black bars show this exponential increase in landings. So this is something that uh, is at a 60 year high for this species, a species that going back uh, in the late 19th century was over harvested and, and took a long, long time to come back. But this is the, uh, the sort of recent dynamics from the most recent stock assessment. So really uh, a good news story for the region. And yet within this good news story in assessments, going back to when we started this work in 2013 and 2015, there were these outstanding issues. And so this is part of the secret life of halibut. So for the biology, the spawning areas and the spawning times, what are the seasonal migrations and habitat preferences, um, length of growth, which is so, uh, so key, the development of a stock assessment model that is, uh, um, has come a long way since then to get at uh, uh, biomass exploitation rates and reference points. And then some of the uncertainty in stock structure where we really started was with uh, electronic tagging to get at, uh, at some of these questions. So in 2013, there was a uh, meeting convened with uh, members of fish harvesters unions from five different provinces. Uh, there was a network of collaborators from CIFR, uh, from the FFAW, which is the uh, uh, Newfoundland region uh, fisheries union, from DFO, from even the International Pacific Halibut Commission, where they had expertise in electronic tagging and, uh, and work on Pacific halibut, and even the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, where at that time Arnaud Labrie was before he came to CIFR. Um, and there was consensus by the end of this meeting uh, for the need for a Gulf-wide program on longline survey and tagging uh, to get at some, uh, some questions of baseline biological data for some of these large halibut. So this is something that uh, sort of talks to the origins of this work. And within CIFR, uh, between Dominique Robert and myself, back in 2013, we invested some uh, grant money into pop-up satellite tags as a way to get at these questions. So there's three different tags here, and the middle tag by Wildlife Computers is something that we used first in 2014 and really stuck with since then because of its uh, performance. And in 2017, 
the tag on the very bottom there is called a MR PAT or a mark report tag. And this is a tag that can be put onto the same large halibut as a, as a wildlife computers tag. And instead of recording temperature and depth and light level, and even now acceleration as those larger tags do, uh, what it does is it pops up and says, I was here on this date. So you get a really precise uh, geolocated estimate or a, a, not an estimate, but a location for each fish. And we can uh, use this to look at uh, the geolocated estimates based on some of these environmental data that are recorded in the larger tags. So as we're going to show, uh, there's no need to uh, recover the tags to get some data from these, and the data streams have, have become sort of more and more um, um, sort of uh, rich. And there are some inherent sort of limitations. Before, before we get to that, I'll give you a short video, I think it's about two minutes of the tagging operations. So this is a vessel leaving uh, Port Ashwa, and in this program, we've been lucky to be able to have budgets and travel programs where we can really pick our days because this is key to success. This is work done on 35, 45, 52 footers. Um, this is a 45 footer out of Port Ashwa. So to be able to wait for weather windows like this uh, can make all the difference for tagging and as you'll hear for other events as well. So these are long lines. This is the way that uh, almost all these halibut are caught. Um, it's being baited here. And these fish come up in great condition for tagging. These fish don't have a swim bladder. They uh, take tags very well. Originally, we had sort of covered them over with the, with the material to sort of shield them. And in fact, when we're actually tagging these fish with multiple tags, they don't move a muscle. And this is very different than fish that are halibut that come up in uh, trawls, for example. So with one hook through the lower lip, the fish is on board. And in some years, we've had fin clips to, uh, and some colleagues have developed techniques to identify sex based on fin clip samples. This is a veterinary ultrasound that's being used uh, by our colleague Tim Lower to look at whether this is a male or a female halibut. Uh, that's a little sort of condition the fish, a little poke there to make a hole in the tough skin, and then a tag that's going to go into it uh, very, very quickly. So again, this is work done in collaboration uh, with harvesters, putting in this uh, pop-up satellite tag. There's additional green tags that are high value, $100 tags that have been used in this program and been used um, since 2017 in the Gulf wide long line program. And here's the spaghetti tags. So anyone getting these fish back could get $100 for the green tag. Uh, we give a reward, I think of $500 for the pop-up tag in addition to the high value of this fish. So that catch a fish with these tags uh, could be a, a lucrative day for anyone. So this is a process that takes uh, just a couple of minutes and with that, the fish goes back into the water once these tags are checked and, uh, and recorded. Uh, so this, again, is a great fish for tagging. Um, large bodied, can take these larger tags. And then, as you'll see here, just a couple of flicks of the tail and it's back down to the bottom. So we have uh, experience tagging now um, hundreds of these fish. And again, with pop-up satellite tags, part of the technology is the fact that that tag stays on for a program time pops off the fish, flows to the surface, and transmits data to the satellites. So this is a, an old slide, uh, circa 2013, where the data resolution in a tag that was recorded was around two minutes. And if that's the case, we call this archive data. There's about 263,000 records per year at two minute resolution. But there's limits to how much can go to the satellites. So about 11,000, 12,000 go up to the satellites uh, from that fish and based on the orientation, or uh, of the uh, tag in the water bobbing around for 10 days or so, there's less than 5,000 records that then come from that tag. So this is a limitation. This was something that was recognized at the start of this program, and we deal with gaps, we deal with uh, low resolution data, wouldn't expect the full time series. But as uh, in so many things, new technologies arise. And one of the uh, new technologies that arose and was uh, identified to us by our colleague Tim Lower, shown there at the far left in the bright jacket, was this uh, antenna. And what this antenna does is it picks up on the Argo signal that's being transmitted from the tag to the Argo satellite system. And it has a direction finder and a strength level. And this antenna then can be mounted on the top of a wheelhouse, can be mounted on a backpack, and we can pick up these tags uh, from miles away with a starting point as shown in the app on the phone. You get an initial position, head towards that, and then pick these things up with this direction finder and then scoop them out of the water. And it sounds, very simple. Um, but there's a number of things that have to go absolutely right for this to be successful. The first is the, the fish must be in the reach of vessels. 
And so for offshore uh, work in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, many of the fish were, some of the fish weren't based on um, sort of orientation of where we had vessels sort of lined up. Uh, in many cases, the fish came back to where they were tagged, which was a great thing. So we've had great success with these tags releasing as programmed, transmitting to satellites and getting that GPS fix for an initial location. Then having shipped to shore communications, so which in itself has also evolved in the last 10 years, um, detect the, the uh, tag at sea with this direction finding antenna, and then the correct sea state to actually collect these tags. And play a little video here. And this video is uh, showing the uh, device set up in the wheelhouse right beside the skipper. So you can see this uh, pinging once every minute, hopefully picking up each ping and then slowly steaming towards at the minimum speed to get up on these tags and then to actually locate them and to swing around or to uh, get them with a dip net. So this is uh, a quick process or a quicker process to get out there. And in the end, this is actually the first tag that we uh, recovered. So it's great. Uh, uh, it's great success. This was 15 to 20 miles offshore. And the gentleman holding the tag there um, saying, uh, who would have thought you could come 15 or 20 miles out and pick up this tag, right? Kind of like a needle in a haystack. So this was a uh, great success in that first year. This would be 2014 then, going out there, collecting six out of 20 tags that we put out, actually recovering them, getting the full archive time series, and uh, everyone is uh, is delighted. So the benefits of recovering these tags rather than having them go through the satellite system is this uh, uh, high resolution and continuous data. Again, these are two minute um, resolution data and the archive temperature and depth are both shown there. And these have been sort of the bread and butter of what we've worked with. And from this tag, one of the things that uh, I think it was uh, Dominique first noticed was this pattern of uh, interesting um, depth profile. So we've got these depth profile things not changing that much. And then in, in some of these archive data, we have this period in February where these uh, depths really change. And what it turns out from years of work and a, and a master's student, uh, Rachel Marshall, as you'll see some of the work, um, these are actually spawning rises. And we can detect these at the resolution of two minute data. We can't detect these at the resolution of satellite transmitted data. And what this represents is a female fish that each three or four days at a temperature of five degrees or so, um, hydrates a batch of eggs, uh, does a spawning rise, spawns those eggs, and then uh, um, comes back down to the uh, to the benthic zone. And we know that this three or uh, three or four day pattern uh, is consistent with spawning rises based on fish in captivity, based on Pacific halibut as well at temperatures of around five degrees. So this again is from that first year, giving us some indication of the timing of spawning of these fish, uh, which is quite different than fish from other. Um, from other uh, management units. And there are also clear differences between male and female where the females have this, uh, this sort of obligate uh, window and delay between uh, different spawning periods. And it turns out males, uh, not the same energetic uh, limitations and uh, a very, very different pattern. So these patterns in themselves have been used to diagnose uh, whether some fish have been males or females in some cases. So the other part of this uh, program, and this is something where Arnaud Labrie uh, led this based partly on uh, uh, knowledge that he obtained during his PhD here at MUN, but this is the geolocation model, or where is this fish going each day over the course of a, of a year? And so Arnaud has developed, and Paul Gatti, a postdoc, uh, further developed some of these, uh, these techniques using hidden Markov models to, uh, to actually get at where these uh, fish have been uh, based. So it's a process model of a 2D random walk with an observation model of uh, likelihood. And what this is based upon is the temperature and the depth profiles of these fish. And, we, and Arnaud was able to, uh, to generate uh, with oceanographers different seasonal uh, patterns in temperature. And this is something that really helped to drive this uh, geolocation modeling. So that's an oversimplification. And there's three papers that have been published on geolocation of uh, Atlantic halibut. Uh, but the other benefit of uh, these pop-off satellite tag recoveries is there's no gaps. This is daily resolution. And what I'm gonna show you here in this animation is 13 fish from Northern Gulf of St. Lawrence that were tagged in uh, 2014, uh, eight fish from Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence that were tagged in 2014 and where they go over the course of this uh, cycle. And also I'll note that in February, some of these fish were tagged with these pop-off, mark report pop-off tags to actually get a location of where they are that can be used to challenge or validate the geolocation modeling. 
So these fish uh, go towards deeper waters. They go towards deeper waters in winter consistently. And these are the, the again, the time period uh, and the location of spawning. So right there is when these tags would pop off to confirm or to challenge the geolocation models and could tell us that these fish were actually in these, uh, these deeper waters. And so not every fish was tagged with both tags, uh, but uh, part of Paul Gotti's work was a test of these uh, geolocation models using uh, different techniques to actually get at, uh, at how well these models are representing where these fish uh, are. And it turns out that uh, on the, the sort of scale of dozens of kilometers, these models are working very, very well to identify where these fish are over the course of a year. So then into October when these tags pop off, there's where the fish ended up. Um, so this is a, a very, very powerful tool that can give information at the level of individuals and then with more and more tags, the level of uh, uh, perhaps um, getting at some process at the, at the population level. So we've had uh, some success again, going back to 2013 when these uh, 20 tags were first put on, we recovered six of those. Uh, then the next year um, we connected, co collected one of two, um, but you can see here in this, the second last column, the numbers of tags recovered. So in 2017, when the tagging was at a gulf wide scale, as you'll see, we recovered 22 of these tags. And in total, what this has done for us, because the tag manufacturers recognize the value of these tags and the components, we can have them refurbished at 50% of the cost. And so what this has done is grown our program by about $150,000 by investing in a couple of these uh, detectors, going out and making the effort to get these uh, tags recovered under all sorts of conditions or favorable conditions. So this work, again, going back to Corson's book on secret life of lobster, talking about coordination with uh, fish harvesters, this is born out of uh, discussions with the uh, fish harvesting union and has since used more than 20 different vessels uh, across uh, Newfoundland and into Quebec as well, PEI and Nova Scotia as well, both to tag fish uh, and to uh, undertake these recovery missions too. And so initially some of the data that uh, in a paper that Hannah Murphy led was used to characterize uh, the depth uh, use of these fish, and this is at a time when DFO was coming up with a long line survey in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and asking questions of, well, which which depths might be sort of excluded from a plan so that uh, these long line surveys are maximized in their deployments. So the uh, long line survey was pitched for September, and so this gives a, an idea of where in the Gulf of St. Lawrence the fish are using uh, different depth habitats. And by 2017, then, this is the first year of that long line survey that's Gulf wide. This is something that was brand new and has since been used in all sorts of ways to inform subsequent assessments, including in 2023, the development of uh, biomass index and reference points for this stock. And conventional tagging was done. And at the same time, um, we came up with uh, support for 36 satellite tags to be put out at this uh, across this zone. And those different red pins represent the numbers of tags that were put out at different locations within this uh, program. And Arnaud also led the deployment of two moored uh, pop-up satellite tags for, again, for validation of, uh, of these geolocation models. So why not go even bigger? And uh, this, this did become bigger with uh, Dominic Robert leading the development and uh, application of an NSERC strategic program that brought in five different fish harvesting organizations at a Gulf wide scale to match the scale of the long line survey to match the scale of those pop up satellite tags being deployed. And uh, we've had some great success with that. So that NSERC program, which ran from 2017 to 2021 started uh, again with this uh, sort of this life cycle of halibut putting pop up satellite tags on them, looking at uh, their spawning behavior, their spawning locations as shown there and also getting into more um, sort of parts of the life cycle with collaborators. So with Danny Dumont at uh, University of Quebec at Rimouski, looking at oceanographic modeling of larvae based on the spawning locations of halibut, where these things end up. And further with Pascal Sirois, with his uh, expertise in odolith microchemistry, looking at some of the odolith cores and asking the question of where might the nursery zones in the Gulf of St. Lawrence be for these uh, smaller fish. So again, this is taking a sort of life cycle approach and uh, had great success with the uh, trainees uh, here and in Quebec as well, and also with the uh, collaborators from DFO and other groups uh, to, uh, to bring this information into uh, assessments. So Rachel Marshall was based here as a master's student, and one of the questions that she was able to address using all these pop-up satellite tags at a Gulf-wide scale is where and when do halibut spawn? 
So based on some of those spawning behaviors, based on fin clips to identify males and females, based on ultrasound, based on expert sort of opinion on males and females, brought all these things together in a paper that was published uh, a few weeks ago to report that the spawning of this fish is in mid-February. It's consistent with males and females overlapping in time. That's a good thing. And importantly, this differs quite a bit from the southern stock where uh, October to January timing is, is when they spawn. And what this might actually represent is uh, a way to explain this, this uh, subtle genetic differences between the Gulf stock and the southern stock that's been reported in the literature in 2021. And that this might be a way of uh, maintaining reproductive isolation between these two different stocks. And again, spawning, overwintering, and mixing in these deep channels is a big part of this uh, Gulf stock. So the other thing that can be done, as sort of alluded to with these tags, is uh, actually looking at uh, behaviors on the order of annual cycles to actually seconds now. So these new generation tags since 2017 uh, provide information on the order of every five seconds. And remember in 2013, this was every two minutes. So this is a, a, a real step forward in terms of uh, what's collected. Also, since 2017, there's accelerometers within these tags that collect information every five seconds on uh, gravitational accelerometry for each fish. And what this shows is a real progression from the first panel showing over the course of a year to the B panel showing that those uh, spawning rises over the course of a month or so. Uh, the C panel showing one of those spawning rises um, on the order of just uh, two hours. And then the fourth panel D showing the gravitational acceleration anomalies uh, on the scale of every five seconds. So you have all this information from one tag and can get at a lot more questions of spawning behavior than ever would have been uh, guessed at with those initial tags, two minute resolution, uh, 30 or 60 minute uh, uh, transmitted data. Uh, so this is uh, some real interesting steps forward. And Rachel took this uh, couple steps further, looking at this uh, gravitational acceleration, for example, at the time of spawning. So for each of these 118 different female fish, she looked at the peak of the spawning rise and the peak of uh, uh, gravitational acceleration. And what she found was uh, that just prior to the peak of these spawning rises, as these fish are going up in the water column, they also take off and accelerate. And so, again, these are all data at a five second resolution, which isn't the sort of the, the best for accelerometry, but it's hinting at maybe that's this release of eggs at that apex of the spawning uh, rise when these fish are accelerating super fast, shaking out those eggs the way that's been documented for other species. So, this is something that's hinting at uh, the way that this technology can be used. And, uh, and sort of further questions that can be asked of spawning behavior given this uh, data resolution. So we started with uh, these tags. Um, some of the information from these tags, as well as uh, lots of other information from uh, trawl surveys and other things have gone into um, Gulf wide long line survey design. This has been used to improve stock assessment inputs. We've done some lots of work with halibut geolocation, uh, including a uh, paper on sort of the Western Newfoundland scale and the stock wide scale led by uh, Paul Gotti. And as I showed, some of the work on reproductive behavior uh, that uh, Rachel Marshall was able to wring out of these tags uh, has been uh, has been some great some great work. This has also been done um, in parallel with some work by others at uh, Dalhousie. And DFO looking at genetic data and questions that uh, that can really be tied together and are increasingly being tied together. And the last part is about uh, val validation of geolocation. It's one thing to say a fish was here based on the tag. It's another thing to have independent uh, validation of those um, spatial models. And uh, Paul Gotti again led this in a great paper uh, in Fish and Fisheries. So again, going back to sort of uh, the secret life and Corson's book and fish harvesters and scientists uh, sharing information. Part of what we also did was go to uh, a number of road shows on the West Coast in this example, uh, showing all the different communities, the numbers of fish harvesters that showed up to hear what we were talking about. And this actually reached about half of the Gulf uh, Newfoundland fleet on the West Coast, which is a great thing in February and March of uh, 2019. Uh, Dominique Robert uh, led presentations in PEI and in Quebec as well. And not only were we able to share information and get uh, fish harvesters feedback and get some of their uh, uh, some thoughts on sort of what we, uh, the way we think these systems work, uh, but this also led to interviews with fish harvesters by Rachel Marshall to have a second, uh, to have input into a second chapter in her work. 
uh, where she combined electronic tagging information and fish harvesters perspectives to look at ocean management concerns. So 16 halibut harvesters during those road shows uh, was, uh, was great work uh, by, uh, by Rachel. And what this shows is the locations of these tracks of different fish that have been tagged and the locations in the middle of uh, Old Harry. This is, was a uh, potential uh, oil and gas development, a well that seems to be right very close to where these uh, fish have their spawning habitats for the winter time. There's also these gray areas that are the uh, areas of traditional winter redfish uh, fishery zones and redfish fishery coming back with the recruitment from uh, certain year classes from 10 years ago or so. The redfish uh, interaction is a real uh, big one and it's, it's on the radar of halibut fishers on the west coast. And the other connection that uh, Arnaud Labrie sort of had was to sort of northern pulp where he identified this uh, outflow of effluent from northern pulp development and how some of these fish might come in contact with that uh, outflow. So again, this is using not only um, pop-up satellite data, but information from fish harvesters. And, uh, and Rachel has many, many quotes in there from fish harvesters uh, where they see some similarities in their perspectives and the work that we've done, some differences. And uh, this is a way to combine these types of information. So something a little different than uh, any of us might have thought of at the start of this program. So this is uh, um, work that has gone into the assessments of Atlantic halibut in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The, again, the uh, information on habitat use went into the development of the long line survey. Long line survey has been going on since 2017 with uh, allocations from the overall TAC. And what that led to was information on uh, conventional tagging and tagging recording or the reporting rates, which led to the first biomass estimate and other uh, important estimates in the 2023 assessment. So this has really come a long, long way in these, uh, this last decade. Another thing that made it into the assessments was, again, Paul Gotti's stock-wide um, spawning grounds within the, uh, the 2018 assessment, and then was published in this uh, ICES paper. And the other things would be migrations, uh, where they're coming to, where they're going, where they're uh, coming from, where they're going to, um, the spawning areas, the spawning timing, habitat use. And uh, it's interesting, again, that the spawning timing might uh, explain some of these sort of subtle uh, but significant genetic differences between these two stocks. So that was all done in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And so where do you go from there? One of the directions that uh, that uh, Krista Rainsier, um, who's uh, of course a student within this program, uh, one of the ways that she's taken this was to get all the information from conventional tagging, from electronic data storage tags, internal tags, from pop-up satellite tags, and to combine this information on the scale of the region. How much connection is there among these different uh, management units? How much movement is there within management units? And she has uh, come up with this great uh, schematic summarizing information from pop-up satellite tags, from these data storage tags and conventional tags, showing, for example, summer feeding along the coasts and these, uh, these uh, winter and spawning grounds, uh, potential spawning sites identified here, and then these median distances that recapture from release for conventional tags, how far did they uh, go and how far um, or how far was it from the tagging location uh, for those tags. So she's uh, working uh, and has been working on a number of different questions uh, to quantify the behaviors, the mixing among and within these different stocks. Uh, this is ongoing work. She has a paper that uh, just this week, I believe, was, uh, was considered for revision in Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. Uh, she has a second chapter that's again using conventional tags, which are pop-up or conventional tags and pop-up satellite tags with locations of tagging shown here. And what she's doing is uh, quantifying uh, mixing across the different regions and across these different NAFO zones at different times of years, uh, and even across different uh, international boundaries to the US, to the French territory at St. Pierre and Miquelon to look at what are the implications for fisheries that are prosecuted at different times of year for these different, uh, uh, different tags. So I'm not going to show any of her work because she's going to present her work uh, herself in her exit seminar and uh, leave some sort of secrets to be revealed during that uh, work or that uh, presentation. But what I'd like to just sort of uh, get towards the end and finish off on is additional work and avenues for research that have come up uh, in this, uh, this process. So through the uh, uh, collaborations with researchers at, uh, within MUN and with Dalhousie within the Ocean Frontier Institute, um, 
in 2019, Dr. Daniel Rosante and uh, Joanna Mills Fleming led a, a workshop on closed kin marker capture. And this is something that if you're interested in sort of uh, uh, sort of state of the art tagging and stock assessment, this is something you Google and look at how close kin marker capture uses parent offspring uh, genetic tags, actually tagging a parent to an offspring, uses some age information, some important uh, life history information into a model uh, that can give you information on adult abundance, uh, natural mortality, and other uh, very, very important things that are totally independent of uh, surveys or catch rates and other information. So this is something that uh, within the Rosante lab, um, a very keen graduate student has been leading at the scale of the Southern stock. This is something that's also sort of on the horizon for the Gulf of St. Lawrence as an independent estimate of some of these uh, key parameters. So this is very, very exciting and uh, something that uh, that uh, came up um, and sort of evolved within this, uh, this uh, pop-up satellite tagging program. And now is, uh, is sort of uh, very, very interesting to go in this direction. And the other question, of course, is uh, uh, where else are halibut showing up and where are they coming from? So in uh, this year and in 2022, we've heard many, many reports, as has the uh, Fish, Food and Allied Workers Union, of halibut showing up in areas where they traditionally hadn't uh, been in great abundance, in NAFO areas uh, shown here, 3L and 3K, and even further north into 2J. So these are areas that are outside the boundaries of any halibut uh, management unit as shown here. And the questions are sort of where are they coming from? Uh, where are they going to? Are they completing their life histories within these uh, sort of new zones? Or are they still connected to some of these southern zones or the Gulf of St. Lawrence? So these are important questions for um, uh, potential movement of halibut and spillover under these stocks that keep increasing in size and where the ocean conditions change might have more opportunities uh, in different zones. So these are some of the, uh, the interesting things that are on the horizon in 2024. There are plans that are in the works to get some tags out on fish uh, in that uh, more northerly zone. So some secrets have been revealed for Atlantic halibut. Um, so some of this new information on migrations, on habitat use, on spawning locations and behaviors. This has all been generated through at sea access aboard fish harvesters vessels. So this is one sort of take home message. Uh, the results have been presented during stock assessments, workshops, uh, many, many different uh, places to share these results. The third thing is that there've been technological advances that have happened over the last 10 years uh, that we've taken advantage of. These processes to recover tags using the new antenna, uh, data resolution going from two minute archive to five second archived, accelerometers being built into tags uh, without even sort of being announced. And then feedback to and from harvesters have been uh, really important in terms of uh, uh, getting information uh, from them into the literature in the case of uh, some Rachel's work. And also the, their ability to sort of see what's going on and to identify questions uh, like halibut in regions where halibut um, have uh, not always been uh, to get at uh, new tagging opportunities and new, uh, new advances. And so. If this secret life of halibut was uh, to be written, I think there'd be a few a few pages. And for those people who would be looking at the online version, uh, you can pause it here and look at some of the sort of drier uh, scientific literature that we've been a part of over the last uh, decade or so, with uh, more papers coming out uh, each year, and uh, hopefully contributing to a more fulsome sort of perspective on what halibut are up to, and uh, their importance within the system. So with that, I got a couple of acknowledgement slides. Um, the, at the top here are different funding agencies from the province, uh, from the Research and Development Corporation that really uh, kickstarted some of this work way back in 2013, from NSERC within the Strategic Program and Discovery as well, the Atlantic Fisheries Fund, uh, the Robert and Edith Skinner Wildlife Management Fund that supports my research chair, uh, the Ocean Frontier Institute that's been uh, so instrumental in, in uh, getting this uh, work done at a different scale and bringing universities together, which has been so important. And then down below, some of the organizations um, with which we've uh, had uh, great success and, and uh, lots of fun working. And finally, um, this would be a, a sort of shorter list, but uh, to acknowledge some of the collaborators, I've benefited tremendously through this work, uh, professionally, socially, understanding the culture of our province and other places as well. Uh, so from, I still call them within CIFR, Dominique, uh, and Hannah and Arnaud, uh, Paul Gotti, uh, Rachel and uh, Krista, and Tom Brown for all the support over many, many years. 
The FFAW, this started uh, through a conversation with Jason Spingle and Aaron Carruthers and uh, have been had great fun on board many, many vessels with knowledgeable and generous uh, fish harvesters. And then our colleagues from DFO, from Mont Joli, from uh, the Newfoundland region, from uh, Bedford Institute of Oceanography, uh, great collaborators, great to work with, and Tim Lower from the International Pacific Halibut Commission, um, showing us how some of these things uh, can be done. Again, I thank the organizers for uh, for putting on this uh, series this uh, this year. Very happy to be able to present within it, and I'll stop there and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Oh, I see a, an online hand. I'm going to take over this. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, Eugene, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. If you wanted to ask your question. Or you can write it in the chat too, if that if you like. Hmm. Here we go. Oh, I think you should be able to talk now. You can you hear me? Yep, there you go. Yep. Um, I just had a question about the like how many tags would you need for like a successful research project? I think you mentioned in one paper you had like 10 tags that were recovered, but how many are we talking like the order of like 10 tags, like 30 tags? Like how many would you need? Yeah, so I guess that's the uh... That's the uh, that's an important question and a great question. Um, many studies have very few tags because these tags are quite expensive. And we've had the uh, so, for example, the first papers that we did had uh, on the order of twenty tags maximum, and had some sort of idea of what we thought might be going on in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. That's since expanded to more than hundred tags, uh, with seventy plus recovered. And with colleagues from DFO, those and into the larger um, sort of overall regional zone. Um, I can't remember if the number is 170 or so, but that would be um, that would be uh, a very very high number for studies. And if you think of around the world, who's done tagging and, and numbers of studies? The people that do work on uh, Pacific halibut, lots and lots of tags put out on the order of uh, hundreds. People that do work on uh, bluefin tuna, hundreds. Uh, and I think that this program uh, between uh, colleagues at DFO and their tags and our tags and uh, PEI and others. Uh, this would be among one of the top tag or top programs for numbers of tags that have been deployed and uh, probably also for those recovered too. But I think that uh, to your question, most studies work with uh, a handful of tags and and there's uh, we've looked at some of those numbers in the past before. So this is a, this has become a very, very big program and it's become that program over many years and because of some of the successes that we've had at starting at smaller scales. Okay, and how many, um, like, I'm just with the, with the directional um, tool that you can actually find the tags. Um, how many in a day could you find like the picture of you and Krista out on the boat? Could you find like 5 tags or. Yeah, more? yeah so that's a great question. So we, uh, again, when we get a good satellite. Um, uh, satellite lock on where the tag pops up, then it's a case of how how fast can we get there? And then it takes uh, 15 minutes or, or a half hour. Uh, Sort of longer time in a larger vessel to actually scoop the tag out of the water under great conditions. Uh, we picked these tags up on beaches. We found them buried under rocks with this detector. Um, and yeah, so it's limited by sort of uh, how fast can we get there? Okay, that's really cool. It sounds like you're like explorers going out. You're treasure hunters. It seems like. Yeah, that's right. No, it's a great. Uh, it's a great analogy and. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. And so it's it's great to be able to get the tags back to get the rich data set to get the uh, the sort of uh, some compensation for more tags in the future. So this is a real win win win. Everybody uh, everybody wins for that. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions in the audience? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yep. Go for it. Uh, uh, so. 
the females rise, the males, if I got it right, didn't. So do they have internal fertilization? I know so the males also rise, but they they don't have the same um, sort of structure to the rises where they're spaced out so evenly um, with the difference of three or four days in between each rise at say five degrees. So the males don't have the same energetic limitations, and this has been found in uh, a number of different flatfish species and other um, ground fish species as well, uh, where the female pattern of, uh, of hydrating a batch of eggs rising and spawning those eggs is very, very different than the males. So the males to spawn, uh, we don't have males and females matched up um, in space or in time to know which male or female is mating with which one. But uh, I know that in Rachel's work, she's also looked at sort of depth patterns and how far off the bottom and at which depth are, are these uh, males and females spawning. Obviously, they have to match up uh, in space uh, because there isn't infer internal fertilization. This is external fertilization. Yeah, so because I mean, it must be tricky because if they swimming fast and they shaking off the eggs, as you were saying, then the male would have to follow it and <laughs> and fertilize it on the fly. So. So this is what I'm, I found it. Uh, yeah, no, there's a whole uh, um, whole body of literature that I'm less familiar with, with sort of mating systems and how things actually are achieved, and it's whole sort of sneakers in different uh, fish systems. Uh, so it's a it's a complex world, and I don't know that these tags would get at that information. But yeah, there's a lot of other questions that uh, that could be generated and tested in different ways for how it. Thank you. I'm not sure if all of these people have questions. Do either Pauls have questions? <laughs> if they would like, or anybody, uh, anybody else online? Well, ben, Paul Regular, uh, yep. if you can hear me. Uh, thanks, Sean, for the talk. Uh, really fascinating work, um, and uh, and you know, it's definitely a big challenge trying to peer into their secret lives. But now that you have. Uh, there's, it seems like there's loads of questions that can be asked, and I find those spawning rises really fascinating. I'm just wondering if, uh, if you know anything about how dense Atlantic halibut are. Like, I'm just wondering, okay, now that we're seeing some bits of their lives, can start asking how hard is life for them at particular moments. And so I'm just wondering how much energy does it require to, to climb that water column? Uh, and, of course, I guess it'll be dependent on how dense their body is. Um, so just uh, just wondering if you thought about that or or know anything about that. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. I guess uh, the two things that have to come together is they have to come the males and females obviously have to come together in space and then they have to come together in the sort of vertical zone. I don't know uh, the short answer is I don't know the answer to the energetic requirements for spawning rises. Um, some of the uh, there's been some aquaculture literature on Atlantic halibut that's characterized. Um, the spawning sort of uh, frequency and and maybe there is maybe within that literature there's some energetic uh, estimates but I don't know that off the uh, the top of my head but yeah I guess the one thing that the tags or one of the things that the tags show is that if these fish are from the northern Gulf or from the southern Gulf they can be converge in these uh, these deep channels over winter those deep channels remain at their preferred temperature around five to seven degrees um, so they're they might not all be spawning but they like that uh, type of a water temperature and, and th those channels bringing them together uh, might sort of uh, bring them together in space and and make for less energy um, that it's, it's not like a fish is swimming hundreds of miles um, days before it spawns they, they get there and they might be uh, in sort of good shape because they're concentrated by those uh, those deep waters and those uh, water temperatures so that's a bit of a ramble uh, to address your question mm -hmm. Uh, any questions in the audience in person? Yeah, go for it, Gord. Um, so on, on a lot of your maps, you showed us that there was like like we were able to identify spawning regions. So spawning regions. Have some of these been considered marine refugees or? Um, so I can. So I'm, I'll talk about the Gulf of Saint Lawrence uh, specifically. So there are since twenty. I think it's 18. There are 11 different marine refuges within the Gulf of St. Lawrence that have been identified where bottom contact fishing is uh, sort of eliminated. Um, and to my knowledge, those are based upon uh, information from corals and sea pens and, and benthic habitats more so than Atlantic halibut from what I've read anyway. But if these things happen to, uh, to overlap in space and be a bit of a win-win uh, where halibut are also occupying those zones, then that is actually 
that's a question that we're uh, that we're looking into. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. That was cool to see all of your work summarized like that that you've done over the last ten years or so. Uh, one of the questions I had was at the end. We talked about uh, more bycatch halibut in northern regions. Was that just observed this year, or has that been over the last few years that they've been seeing halibut in two J? Yeah, so I think I received calls in 2022, and I know that. Uh, so I, I don't get that many calls directly from fish harvesters, but I think there was a call to. Uh, uh, it might have gone to Caesar and then sort of come uh, come my way for halibut, but I know that uh, the fishing union would have uh, more information on how much and how many people are reporting that, and they of course meet with their members and get some of this information. So I've heard directly from one uh, gentleman who who says he's fished quite a long time, seeing things that he hadn't seen. Um, but I, I don't know if your question is sort of is it sort of one off or is it multiple years? Uh, so I guess that's. Uh, um, that's something to be seen, and we've also done work this past summer in the uh, Hawk Channel area. Um, so summertime, put down cameras that were baited, um, baited with squid. Didn't see, saw some uh, Greenland halibut, but not Atlantic halibut in that zone at that time. So um, yeah, there's if they move as much as they do in other regions, then they could be uh, sort of episodic within uh, different uh, their bycatch within different fisheries. Uh, and maybe there's differences among years too. But I think that getting some of these tags to get at the question of where they might be going to or whether they're staying within that vicinity would be sort of a, a, an interesting starting point. Yeah, I think part of the reason why I wanted to ask is I feel like I've heard from a lot of people about how, how normal this last year was for a lot of different black fishes in the Great Banks region and how the temperatures this year had such a dramatic effect that I was curious if it was just. This year's temperatures were so crazy driving the north or yeah, no, this would this would have been in 2022. Uh, and so this sort of discussions along these lines have been going on uh, for a while. And yeah, so uh, other industry uh, members have reported the same things. And I know that uh, DFO has done some offshore work uh, targeting other species and run into Atlantic halibut in places uh, maybe that they hadn't expected it. So this is uh, yeah, all these all these pieces need to be uh, put together and uh, maybe tags could be a part of that as well. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, it was really interesting. Um, I was wondering just maybe you explain it and I did that yeah, I get it, but so I I like for the communication between the the, um, the tag and the satellites, uh, I know that for Algopro they have to be next to the surface. How is it going with the algodes? Because I, I think they stay quite deep, you know. Yeah, so um sorry, these tags will be on the halibut for a year and then they're programmed to actually burn off a little pin. Uh, and then they release and they float up to the surface and then they float at the surface and from the surface, then they can co communicate with the satellites. So, yeah, it's not like a, so it's a just like, uh, you can't have the access uh, at, at, at the moment, the fish is uh, in the, uh, uh, in the water, right? It's just at the end of it. Uh, That's right. Yeah. This is not a, like a spot tag or something like that where things would surface and, and transmit. Uh, there's no real time information, so it's kind of like Christmas, I guess, uh, at the end of these things, when you see these tags actually showing up on the app and can go out and start tracking them that these devices are actually working right after being underwater for a year. So that's a, a very good feeling. Uh, but yeah, that's an important point that these are uh, popping off the fish and we get no information unless it transmits to the satellite or we collect the tags or a bit of both. And we have sort of technology advancing. The first tags that we have, and I have an example with me, uh, didn't really pass around, but we have, uh, it has sort of a one directional antenna. So if I point the antenna at you, then, and you're the Argo satellite, then the information gets to you. If I point it this way, it doesn't get to you. And in other generations of tags, it has a braided antenna that's multi-directional so that there's a better chance of that connection. And so we did some tags um, in the field, pointing tags in different directions. And it was remarkable with the, uh, the detector, whether we could pick it up or not uh, based on those earliest tags. And we, we had the two in the one year and could compare them. And it was, uh, it was quite a difference. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really interesting. Yeah, my question should be, uh, do you know if uh, DFO or MSC Applied or suggested any regulation for the fishery based on this results and based on the spawning area or spawning the Yeah, so um, again, going back to some of the initial work, some of the um, so this is used to 
so if your, your question is about regulation, so this has been used sort of to know where sort of they're spawning and, and know the habitats to develop the longline survey. But since that longline survey has been developed, there's been uh, many, many conventional tags that have been put out. And those conventional tags have then informed, for example, the development of a biomass uh, index for the Gulf of St. Lawrence and reference points for that stock. So I guess indirectly um, might take this much credit for some of that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the MSC program, um, I, I'm not sure that this has contributed directly to that. Of course, the MSC came on before uh, any of this work was done. And uh, there's a lot of other things that go into MSC uh, besides uh, some of this tagging information. So I think it's uh, it's it's useful, but it hasn't driven uh, everything uh, that's uh, that's gone on lately. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's just one more question here online by Paul Ryan. Can you go ahead there, Paul? Yeah. Thank you, uh, John. My question is related to the fishery itself, and given the history of this stock, uh, recalling a slide you put up earlier showing total allowable catch, the total allowable catch seems to have increased greatly in the last decade. I'm just wondering if you could comment on whether you think that's sustainable. Yeah, so I think that um, that prior to this year's assessment, there were less things that went into the uh, the stock assessment. So now there is actually a, a biomass estimate that's based partly on uh, conventional tagging. There are reference points and uh, and all these types of things. And I I believe from what I've seen in the assessment so far that the catch rates are well within the. Uh, um, those uh, reference points uh, pointing towards sustainability. So the latest information that DFO has provided uh, suggests that these catch rates would be uh, within that sustainable zone. But you're right, it has increased exponentially um, and uh, it's, uh, it's really taken off. So it's great to see that the information basis on which uh, it's being assessed is, is being broadened along with the catch rates being expanded. All right, thank you. Great. I think we have time for just one more. Uh, so go ahead, Ina. Um, the spotting sites that were identified through the past, have there been any studies looking at if larvae are found there in relation to the spotting we have suggested? Yeah, so I, I cut it out because I have too much stuff. But there is a study from 2023, uh, Gittner and others in the Journal of uh, I I don't know if it's Journal of Fish Biology, but there is a study that actually used so a group from Ramuski went out on an icebreaker in winter, and based on Paul Gotti's estimates of where Atlantic halibut were spawning in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they targeted nets to those zones. They pulled up those nets and they got uh, larval samples of Atlantic halibut as well as Greenland halibut. And Atlantic halibut uh, larval samples are exceptionally rare, um, and uh, they were able to catch some of them sort of handful, I can't remember exactly how many, but it was targeted based on those spawning areas. So again, in the sort of life cycle completion and um, and sort of uh, um, supporting the idea of these are the spawning areas, I think that that, uh, that does support that. So it's a great, uh, it's an interesting study, Gintner and others, uh, 2023. Okay, well, thanks so much, John, and to everyone here who attended online and in person, really appreciate the great turnout. This is the most we've had this whole semester, so it's great to see. Um, and yes, this is our last one for this semester, so we'll start off again in January, and we hope to see you there. I uh, hope you have great happy holidays, and uh, thanks again, John, so much for your talk. We had a great time. Cheers.